Hello there, and welcome back to the introduction to English linguistics. This is the third video on the topic of pragmatics. In the first video, I talked about uh, speech acts and conversational maxims. In the second one, we had a look at conversation and how people behave when they talk. And in this video, I want to present a new idea, namely information packaging. And to get started, I'd like to show you an example. Imagine that your mom calls you on the phone, so you say, hello, and your mom says, it's your mother, what John lost was his wallet. Now, I think if you were to hear this, you would be reasonably confused. Saying, it's your mother, what John lost was his wallet, is a decidedly odd way to open a conversation. And the question is, why is this odd? It's not grammatically wrong, but it's pragmatically very, very odd. Why is that? It has to do with information packaging. Right. I would like you to do a little exercise. So get out a piece of paper and think about the sentence, what John lost was his wallet. In what communicative situation would it be okay to utter this sentence? Imagine a context with several speakers and write down a short dialogue in which a speaker comes up with this sentence. You're ready to do that? Okay, I'll continue. I am willing to bet that your dialogue conforms to the three points that I have on the slide here. First of all, I think that your speakers will already have talked about John. The name John will appear somewhere on the page. Second, I think they already talked about John losing something. Yeah, perhaps his keys or his passport, his um, suitcase. And third, I think that your speakers negotiated a contrast between the lost thing that was talked about earlier and the thing that was actually lost. Yeah, so maybe speaker A says, yeah, remember the uh, story when John lost his suitcase? And speaker B goes, no, 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 actually what John lost was his wallet. Um, details. Right, um, so... Let me give you an overview of what I'm going to do in this video. First, I'll define this idea of information packaging in a bit more detail. And then I want to talk about three principles of information packaging, namely the information flow principle, the principle of end focus, and the principle of end weight. And then in the third part of this video, I will talk about English constructions that can be used for the management of information for information packaging. Okay, so let's get started. What is information packaging? I've used this term five times now, but I haven't explained to you what it is. Um, the main purpose of information packaging is the organization and arrangement of meanings in utterances. Okay, when you're talking to somebody, you are presenting them with information. Some of this information is old, and some of the information is new, okay? And so information packaging is really about relating new meanings to old meanings and thereby facilitating the hearer's job of integrating new information with something they already know. You can compare this to, you know, when you're doing a puzzle, a puzzle and you're looking at one piece of the puzzle in isolation and it really looks like nothing. Yeah, you can't tell what's on there. But in the context of the puzzle that you've already done, yeah, so you add the piece to a section of the puzzle that you've already completed, you can see, oh my god, it's the uh, throat of the um, of the Tyrannosaurus Rex. Yeah. Okay, so that's information packaging relating new meanings to old meanings. <clears throat> in connection with this, utterances that you do, they typically have two parts. One less informative part that relates the utterance to the preceding discourse, what has been said before. This is called given information, old information, presupposed information. And then there's a more informative part that moves the discourse forward, okay? that tells the hearer something new, something they didn't already know. So you add new information or you modify old information. Right. <clears throat> now, how is information packaged? How do you manage the 
old and new information. There are two main linguistic means for doing this, namely intonation on the one hand and syntactic constructions on the other. Let me talk a bit about information, uh, intonation first. So um, I'll read these uh, examples to you. It's the same sentence, but the intonation is different across the four examples. John only introduced Bill to Sue. John only introduced Bill to Sue. John only introduced Bill to Sue. Or John only introduced Bill to Sue. Yeah, the meaning is the same, you might say. But um, depending on my intonation, you get a different idea of what has been discussed before. Okay, so in the first example, um, Sue represents a new idea. Okay, so Sue hasn't been mentioned before. Um, in the last example, John only introduced Bill to Sue. There was, been, there was some other idea uh, of a relation between Bill and Sue going on in the discussion. And the speaker says, no, no, it was only the introduction. Yeah. So there are subtle meaning differences that speakers can convey by means of intonation. And that's information management, information packaging. The second way to manage information is with syntactic constructions. And here I have six examples that convey what looks like the exact same meaning. Okay. As for John, he lost his wallet. He lost his wallet, John. What happened was that John lost his wallet. What John did was lose his wallet. It was John who lost his wallet. And what John lost was his wallet. Okay. So the grammar of English, generous as it is, gives you six different ways of formulating the idea that John lost his wallet. Okay, that raises the question, why? Yeah, Why do we need six different ways to do this? Um, why this luxurious syntactic variety? Well, the answer to that is each of these six variants has a specific information packaging profile, okay? So each of these variants can be uttered in a different context where it's a little different what the speaker and the hearer already share in terms of knowledge that they have in common. Right. Um, so these are called information packaging constructions and the third part of the video will discuss them in more detail. These are constructions that are sensitive to the structure of the communicative situation. So what's been said before, what has not been said before, what the hearer can be expected to know, what the hearer can be expected to figure out from the context. These things, um, yeah, um, these things have to be taken into account when you utter an information packaging construction. So when you use one, you make an educated guess as to what it is that the hearer already knows. And this explains why the example with your mom calling and say it's your mother, what John lost was his wallet, is so strange. Um, your mom makes a very poor educated guess as to what it is that you already know. Okay, You um, don't necessarily know which John she's talking about. You don't know that John has lost something. You don't know that this wallet is something else than what he may have lost, and so on and so forth. All of these pieces of knowledge you don't have. And so it's odd for your mom to use a WH cleft. That's what this construction is called. All right. <clears throat> um, so when you're using an information packaging construction, that's the fun bit, uh, you engage in some kind of mind reading. Now, that's not a hocus pocus activity. Rather, you guess what it is that the hero knows and what the hero does not know. And then you present new information accordingly. So effectively, you're saying to the hearer, look, here's a bit of information I think you already know, but here is a piece of information that I think is new to you, that's interesting, okay? Um, so you're showing awareness of what your hearer knows and does not know, and that is something that's very much expected of you. If you don't do that, um, you will start losing friends very, very soon. Okay, let me talk about principles of information packaging, namely the information flow principle, the principle of end focus, 
and the principle of end weight. The principle of information flow essentially is a certain ordering of given information and new information. Let's try uh, to analyze one example here. Person A asks, uh, when will you come back? And person B can answer in two different ways. B1, uh, we'll come back next week. Answer B2, next week we'll come back. Which one would you choose and why? Okay. Uh, confronted with this choice, many speakers actually say that B1 is better than B2. Why would that be better? Well, B1 orders given and new information in such a way that you have given information first, yeah, linking your response to what's been going on before, anchoring it, and then new information is taking up in the continuing discourse. So this, in a way, makes it easy for the hearer to process what is said. It's like, um, you know, you, first you connect the little new piece of the puzzle to uh, what you've already connected, and then you can see more clearly what it is that is shown on the piece of the puzzle. Okay, there's a second principle that is very, very similar. That's the principle of end focus. Now, a clause normally has at least one point of focus, yeah, where the action is, where the new stuff comes in. And this typically falls upon the end of the clause. Yeah? That's a very prominent syntactic point. Uh, and again, I brought a little example. Person A says, tomorrow we'll go to the museum. And then person B utters a protest. Uh, so person B says in variant one, but it's the zoo that I want to see. Or person B could say, but what I want to see is the zoo. Okay, which one would you choose? How would you voice your protest? Who wants to see the museum? Nobody does. Um, so answer B2 is in accordance with the end focus principle. The focus bit, the zoo, is at the end. Okay, so it's prominent. Person A knows that you're not um, you're not okay with going to the museum. Note that it's also in accordance with the given a new uh, principle. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. The third principle is the principle of end weight. Um, if an utterance contains long parts and short parts, this principle says place the long part at the end of the utterance. Yeah. Uh, this is quite often in line with the information flow principle because given information tends to be uh, phrased in, in a short way. Okay. Sometimes we use pronouns, uh, but new information we need to present more fully than given information. We use longer structures, we use more complex constructions, we use more words, okay, more description. Uh, and so the end weight principle often works hand in hand with the information flow principle and also with the end focus principle. Let me give you an example. Um, here are two sentences, and again, your task is to decide which one you like better. So, variant A, it may take them a little while, but it's important that you contact them to make a housing application and let them know of your needs. Right. Variant B. It may take them a little while, but that you contact them to make a housing application and let them know of your needs is important. Which one do you find more difficult? And why do you think that might be? So, I think that what you said is sentence B is way more difficult. Why is sentence B more, dif uh, sentence B more difficult? Well, uh, in processing sentence B, you have to keep that, that clause, yeah, the bit in bold, you have to keep that in memory before you reach the end of the sentence and find out that, okay, this is important. It could have been something else. It could, could have been unimportant or it uh, could have been anything, right? So, uh, variant A is more economical from a processing perspective. You know that something is important and then the speaker tells you, okay, look, uh, this is important, namely that you contact them to make a housing application and so on and so forth. Right. Okay. So here's where it gets interesting. Sometimes there's conflict between the three principles. Normally, 
all three of them agree with each other, they work hand in hand, they reinforce one another, but sometimes they are in conflict. So here I would actually like you to pause the video again and think a couple of minutes if you can come up with answers to these questions yourself. Um, again, two variants from a research article here. Um, and sentence A goes, that similar relationships occur with these two species under field conditions in Saskatchewan was suggested by Pickford, 1960-1966a. Variant B, Pickford, 1960-1966a, suggested that similar relationships occur with these two species under field conditions in Saskatchewan. All right, what I want you to think about is this. Which of the two is favored by the information flow principle? Yeah, given information first, new information then. Which one is favored by the principle of end weight? Short stuff first, long stuff at the end. And lastly, which variant do you prefer yourself? Okay, so pause the video and um, okay, once you're done, I will continue. Okay, which one is favored by the information flow principle? Um, here I would say it's safe to say A is favored by the information flow principle because similar relationships, yeah, if you're talking about similar relationships, they're similar to something that you've already talked about. Okay, so that's given information. And the new information is that this guy Pickford talked about this in the 60s. Okay, trouble is the principle of end weight is not okay with this, yeah? Uh, that similar relationships occur with these two species under field conditions in Saskatchewan. <gasps> okay, long that clause, the principle of end weight screams, put me at the end, now! And, um, well, the B variant does that, okay? There we have the that clause at the end. And, um, well, the compromise is that here we have new information at the very beginning, Pickford, 1960, 1966a. Okay, so which one do you prefer? I would say that this depends in a way on the question whether you are a native speaker of English or a proficient learner of English. Okay, proficient learners they tend to have more difficulties with processing so they would say variant B is better because it facilitates their processing. Okay, you don't have to keep this long that clause in mind. Um, native speakers, they have a lot of experience with their language and so processing difficulties, not that hard, you know, and uh, A sounds good enough, okay? And it, it's in, in accordance with the information flow principle, so they pick that. Right. With all of this in mind, I would like to come to information packaging constructions, English sentence types that are used for the management of given and new information. Um, specifically, I'll have something to say about these construction types, namely the passive, existential there, cleft sentences, extraposition, and dislocation constructions. So, let's start. Uh, here's an example of the passive, Lord Haddington was poisoned by his butler classic case of the passive. Why do people use a passive here? Well, you can manage the information flow from given to new yeah? uh, and maintain things like end focus and end weight. Uh, most commonly, the subject in a passive contains given information. So you would use this here when Lord Haddington has already been talked about. Uh, the by phrase represents new information, yeah? Who done it? The butler. It's always the butler. Um, okay, let's look at a real-life example. Um, okay, here's an example that's introduced by a sentence. Almost all entrants to teaching in special schools in England complete a recognized course of initial teacher training. And now, how does this text continue? Variant A. Such courses are offered by university departments of education as well as by many polytechnics and colleges. And variant B. University departments of education as well as many polytechnics and colleges offer such courses. Okay, reread the paragraph and then uh, ask yourself which option would you choose and why.
You can pause if you like, but I'll continue now. Um, many readers choose option one, yeah, because that would be in accordance with the information flow principle. Okay, um, so this phrase, such courses, that's information that's already present in the introductory sentences, and it's in accordance with the end focus and end weight principle. So, um, <clears throat> university departments of education, as well as many polytechnics and colleges, massive noun phrase, yeah, it's very long, and the end principle, uh, end weight principle says, you know, at the end, at the end, the whole thing. And um, it's new information, so the uh, end focus principle says, well, that's the focus bit, it should be at the end. Okay, so we have three votes for the passive, none for the active. That's what people do. Existential there, exemplified by sentences such as, there's a mouse in the kitchen. Yeah, essentially, it's the same information as if you were to say, a mouse exists in the kitchen. Yeah, but that's nothing that you would actually say. So why do people use existential there? Well, you can convey some more information than the mere existence of something. You can indicate when or where something exists. And the subject of a there clause, that's typically an indefinite noun phrase. Indefinite noun phrases, that means they are new information. Yeah. They're introducing a new topic. Um, there's a mouse in the kitchen. <clears throat> Existential there can be used to maintain end focus and end weight. So let's look at two examples here, uh, variant A. There are many people who believe sincerely that you can train children for life without resorting to punishment. And variant B. Many people who believe sincerely that you can train children for life without resorting to punishment exist. <laughs> okay, which option would you prefer? Of course, you would prefer the A variant. Okay, why would you prefer it? Well, A conforms to end weight. Yeah, many people who believe and so on and so forth. That is a large, big, fat noun phrase. So the end weight principle wants it at the end. Uh, but also, end focus is um, advocating the A variant here. Okay, that something exists. Okay. But uh, what exists? That is the question. Moving on to cleft sentences. Um, a cleft sentence, that's a structure that um, breaks information in a sentence into two parts in order to provide an extra focus. There are three important types that I'd like to present, namely it clefts, wh clefts, and th clefts. Th clefts are sometimes also called reverse WH clefts. Let me show you examples. Uh, here's an it cleft. It's the wife who decides. That corresponds to a simple sentence like the wife decides. WH cleft starts with a WH word. Yeah. What I want is a gin and tonic. Corresponds to a simple sentence, I want a gin and tonic. And uh, the TH cleft or reverse WH cleft is that's what I'm talking about. Um, corresponds to the simple sentence, I'm talking about that. Right. <clears throat> um, let me move on to extraposition constructions. Here's an it extraposition. Uh, it's disturbing that John spends so much time on Facebook. Compare the sentence to um, a sentence such as that John spends so much time on Facebook is disturbing. Why is this second variant with the initial that clause perhaps a little undesirable. Well, um, okay, you have a long thing at the beginning that John spends so much time on Facebook, so the principle of end weight is not exactly happy with that. Um, <clears throat> so, it would be desirable to have an alternative solution and it extraposition provides this alternative solution. Extraposition means you move a constituent, such as the subject or an object, outside their normal position. Yeah? Uh, and when this happens, 
you use a pronoun, namely a dummy pronoun it, in the subject position of the main clause. Okay, so something is disturbing. Yeah, say it is disturbing. But this it is very complex. Yeah, so it's expressed by this that clause. And rather than having the that clause subject in place, you extrapose it. Okay, so you use the it and extrapose the long, heavy subject to the end of the sentence. So extraposition serves end focus and end weight. Um, there are different extraposed clause types. For instance, uh, what you've just seen is an extraposed uh, that clause. It's disturbing that John spent so much time on Facebook. You can also have extraposed um, WH clauses. It's not clear what they really want. Yeah, corresponding to what they really want is not clear. And then infinitive clauses. It's important to give clear guidelines. Extraposition. Okay, last construction type here, dislocation constructions. Um, they come in two shapes, yeah? uh, left dislocation and right dislocation, and they have certain uh, tasks that differ from one another. Here we have an example of left dislocation. Your brother, he's a real genius. Yeah? So we have the definite noun phrase, your brother, uh, and in left dislocation it occurs before the main clause. Um, the dislocated noun phrase marks a topic. So if I say your brother, he's such a genius. The brother is a topic and I say something about that brother. He's a genius. Um, in right dislocation, it's exactly the other way around. So I can say, oh, he's such a genius, your brother. Um, so there I have the noun phrase dislocated to the end. Um, why do people do this? Well, in left dislocation, you use the NP to mark the topic. Take an example like this one. One of the guys I work with, he said he bought over $100 in lottery tickets. So he, in the main clause, is the topic. And since um, one of the guys I work with is a lengthy description, um, I don't want to have this in the same clause as all the other information. So I, in a way, dislocation constructions are also used to um, distribute information um, more widely across what you say. Okay, Don't have all the information in one place. No, present some information that the hero can absorb and then some new information that the hero can absorb. So uh, in this example, one of the guys I work with, okay, the hero gets it, well, he said he bought over $100 in lottery tickets. Yeah? And that way, you can get a hero to process several, proce uh, several items of new information. Right dislocation often serves the, the purpose of clarification. So you can ask something like, has it got double doors, that shop? And there the noun phrase clarifies what the pronoun it refers to, just in case the hero was wondering, you're making sure that they get what do you want to say? Right, that's it for today. Let me summarize what I discussed about information packaging. Information packaging really is about presenting given and new information in such a way that it is easy for the hearer to absorb, to process. And this can be done through intonation, or it can be done through special syntactic constructions. So information packaging constructions, those are things like the passive, cleft constructions, dislocation constructions, extraposition constructions that allow you to switch around the syntactic position of a constituent so that you can give the hearer the information in such a way that it's easy to digest. Information packaging constructions thus are sensitive to the structure of the communicative situation. They're sensitive to what has been said before, what is old information, to what has not been said before, what is new information, at least for the hearer, and what the hearer can be expected to either know or figure out from the context. All right, so that's it for today, and I hope you check out the next video too.